It's week 12 NFL review time. Let's go. Buffalo versus Detroit. It wouldn't be Thanksgiving without the Lions being offered up as a sacrifice. Jamal Williams gave Detroit a 7-0 lead before Josh Allen found Isaiah McKenzie to tie it at 7 after 1. The deceptively athletic Jim Rat Allen ran for a 3-yard score to make it 14-7, but the celebration was short-lived as Jared Goff fired a touchdown to tie it at 14. Buffalo had a 17-14 lead in the third when Goff was tackled by Brolick Paul George, aka Ed Oliver, for a safety to make it 1914 Buffalo. But both teams failed to get going offensively until the fourth when Goff found DJ Shark and DeAndre Swift ran in a two point conversion to make it 22 19 Detroit. Detroit had the ball up three but had to punt and they regretted it as Allen led a long touchdown drive ending in a touchdown to Stefan Diggs. But the extra point was no good, giving Detroit a chance to tie the game at 25 with 28 seconds left. Going to overtime right? Wrong, motherfucker. Allen found Diggs on a 36 yard strike, then ran for nine yards to set up Tyler Bass with a game winning 45 yard field goal attempt, which he made to win. The one good thing about being a Lions fan is, no matter what is going on in your sex life, you know the Lions will be there to fuck you at a moment's notice. Dallas versus the Giants. Oh look, a battle between two NFC East also rans. Yawn. The first half was boring as Dak threw two interceptions while Dan Jones stood around and picked his nose. The only scores were touchdown runs by Ewok Elliott and Saquon Barkley. New York had a 13-7 lead at the break, but after a rousing halftime speech by famously not racist at all accounts, Cowboys owner Jerry Jones. Dak came out and fired two third quarter touchdown passes to Dalton Schultz to give Dallas an eight point lead entering the fourth. Dan Jones had a drive down eight to do something, but had to punt. And Dallas expanded the lead to 15 on a Peyton Hender shot, not a porn star name somehow, touchdown run. Jones and the Giants offense did nothing until the last 10 seconds of the game when he threw a worthless and vanity inspired touchdown to make the final score 28 20 more respectable. Have I mentioned that the Giants actually play in New Jersey? False advertisement. Minnesota versus New England. Prime time Kirk Cousins against the Bill Belichick defense? Well, that would be an easy Pats win most years, but this is just Kirk's year as he destroyed the barrel-chested Milf Hunters defense all night. But for really the first time all year, Mac Jones came to play. Cousins found Justin Jefferson to go up 7-0, but Jones fired back with a touchdown to legendarily great hands haver Nelson Aguilar to tie the game at 7. The game became a field goal orgy until late in the second quarter when Cousins found generic white Iowa tight end to go up 16-13. But not before Jones let a drive to tie the game at 16 at the half. Just when it looked like New England was going to turn the tide after a 37-yard touchdown pass from Jones to Hunter Henry to go up 7. Minnesota's Kine Nguangu exploded for a 97-yard kickoff return touchdown to make it 23-all. Then the controversial moment happened. Jones threw what appeared to be another touchdown pass to Henry, but the refs, still getting checks under the table from Tom Brady to sabotage the Patriots to make him look better, said it was incomplete and New England had to settle for a field goal. That's the last time New England would score or have the lead. Minnesota tied it at 26 on their next drive. New England punted. Then Kirk put Minnesota ahead for good by finding scrappy Jim rat daughter dater Adam Thielen for a touchdown. New England had two more legit drives to try and tie the game, but failed each time, dropping to 6-5 and five and now sitting in last place in the AFC East. They're just not as clutch as the first place 5-6 and six Tampa Bay Brady Nears. Washington versus Atlanta. The only thing worse than watching this game was the horrific and half-assed quote-unquote tribute Dan Snyder decided to give to Sean Taylor. You gotta give Snyder credit. Some people tried to hide their evilness, but he leans all the way into it. As for the game, it was a defensive battle battle, aka both offenses mostly suck. The teams traded field goals and Taylor Heineke and Marcus Mariota touchdown passes to make it 10 all at halftime. Washington went up 16-10 on another Heineke touchdown pass. Then Atlanta got on the board with a field goal to make it 16-13 heading into the fourth. Washington kicked a field goal to go up six early in the fourth and Atlanta had a golden chance to win the game and secure first place in the NFC South. But on second to goal from the four with a minute left, Mariota threw an interception to help Tom Brady remain on track for a home playoff game. In typical Falcons fashion, they actually sealed the loss for good on a running into the kicker penalty just for shits and giggles. 28-3. New Jersey Jets versus Chicago. Not only was Zach Wilson benched this week, he literally wasn't even active for the game. Now that is a demotion. But maybe this is what he needs to finally realize he can't have a successful NFL career if he spends most of his free time blowing older women's backs out in the bedroom. The team didn't miss him though, as fan favorite Mike White, not to be racist, showed he wasn't just a flash in the pan from last year. Throwing for 315 yards, 3 touchdowns, and a 149.3 rating. Justin Fields didn't play, so Trevor Seaman was under center for Chicago, and besides a brief moment early in the second when Chicago took a 10-7 lead, this game was all Jets. Chicago didn't score on their last seven possessions because they suck balls. If White can play even somewhat competent football, this Jets team can make it all the way to the AFC Championship game before they lose, a la Rex Ryan. Miami versus Houston. I can breathe a little easier knowing that I am on the good side of two and on, as the formerly average undersized left-hander continues to have a historically efficient season out of nowhere, very similar to 2013. 
2016 Nick Foles and 2016 Matt Ryan. Anyway, Tua really didn't have to do much in this one as the Texans are a glorified community college team who just benched their draft neck human quarterback Davis Mills for Kyle Allen. The game was 30 to nothing at halftime and Mike McDaniel called off the dogs in the second half. No offense to Michael Vick. So yeah, Houston outscored Miami 15 to nothing in the second half, but guess what? It didn't mean shit. You know what else doesn't mean shit? Soccer in America. I haven't watched a second of the World Cup and I am so happy. Carolina versus Denver. A long way to rematch of Super Bowl 50 was just like every other Broncos game since 2016. Boring, low scoring, and it made you feel dumber for having had watched it. It was mono boy Sam Darnold's turn to start a quarterback for the Panthers, and he did a decent job doing the absolute bare minimum while his ground game did most of the heavy lifting. Anyway, Denver didn't get in the end zone until they were down 20 with three minutes left on a worthless Russell Wilson touchdown pass. I was willing to give Wilson some slack, but that's over now. He's been awful all season, and this is the first time I've ever actually thought he could be bad for good. I mean, the guy just got decisively outplayed by Sam Darnold. Mr. Unlimited Embarrassment is more like it, in my opinion. Cincinnati versus Tennessee. As somebody who gets aroused from punts, the first quarter of this game caused me to rip through two pairs of underwear. Even the first touchdown in this game was odd, as Derek Henry was rambling downfield for a huge gain when he got stripped of the ball, which bounced into the opponent's end zone and was recovered by one of his teammates for a score. That's a Mickey Mouse touchdown. But Joe Burrow, who has a very underrated manly chest, gave a terrific hand off to Samaj A. Penis to eventually tie the game at 10 at halftime. The third quarter saw more punts and trading off field goals to make it 13 all heading into the fourth. Burrow got tired of listening to me bitch and moan and using the same jokes, so he fired a 24-yard touchdown to T. Higgins to go up 2013. A Tennessee field goal made it 20-16 to with six minutes left, and this game looked poised for an interesting finish, but Tennessee's Kevin Strong stupidly ran over the center on a Cincy field goal try with 156 left when Tennessee had zero timeouts left, officially ending the game. He should change his name to Kevin Dumb. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> Moving on. Cleveland versus Tampa. When Thomas Brady started off this game on fire, I just sighed and thought that this motherfucker was going to go on a nine-game winning streak to end the season and somehow work his way into the MVP convo. But after throwing his second touchdown of the game midway through the third to give Tampa a 17-10 lead, something weird happened. He didn't close the deal. Brady had four drives with the ball up seven to put the lowly Browns away and failed. Then he had three more chances with the score tied at 17 to put them away and win the game and failed again. Again. As somebody who considers Brady the NFL's angel of death, it was shocking. I really wish he saved some of this suckiness for the fourth quarter of his Super Bowl wins. In his last game as Cleveland starter before Groper Cleveland returns, Jacoby Brissett finally got Cleveland into the end zone late in overtime, and it was capped off by a three-yard game-winning touchdown run by Nick Chubb to win the game 23-17. Of course, as I've alluded to earlier in this video, this is still Tom Brady, so even at 5-6, and six, he is still in first place in the NFC South and on track for a home playoff game. At this rate, it's so absurd and it's so annoying that I hope he goes 5-12 and 12 or 6-11 and 11 and still wins the division and get a home playoff game just to see how fucked up it really is and how extreme his luck really is. Jacksonville versus Baltimore. This was the best game of Trevor Lawrence's career thus far, even if it came against a team that is becoming famous for blowing late leads. The first half was a field goal orgy mixed in with one Lawrence touchdown pass to Jermichael Hasty to give Jacksonville a 10-9 halftime lead. The third quarter was boring as hell too, with only a Baltimore field goal to give them a 12-10 lead entering the fourth, where shit finally got exciting. Baltimore expanded their lead to 19-10 on a Gus Edwards touchdown run. Lawrence led a touchdown drive to make it 19-17, then got a short field goal drive thanks to an Edwards fumble. But Lamar Jackson wasn't done, throwing a touchdown and successful two-point conversion to make it 27-20 Baltimore with two minutes left. Lawrence, who has been terrible in clutch situations his entire career, actually came through, making several great throws to get Jacksonville into the end zone to make it 27-26 with 14 seconds left. And instead of kicking the extra point like a pussy, Doug Peterson and his patented visor that turns women into super soakers decided to go for two. And Lawrence fired a rocket to Zay Jones, just don't look up Zay Jones Hotel on Google, okay? To go up 28-27. Justin Tucker would attempt a 67-yard game-winning field goal as time expired, but it came up short. No offense to Kyler Murray. LA Chargers versus Arizona. Speaking of little Kyler, he got off to a pretty good start in this exciting game, finding first-team all-hotel room respecter DeAndre Hopkins for a touchdown to go up 7-0. That lead ballooned to 10-0, but Justin Herbert dropped his nuts and threw back-to-back -back touchdowns to go up 14-10. That is, until Kyler Tyler ran for a score just before halftime to take a 17-14 lead. The score was 17 all entering the fourth until Kyler found James Conner for a score to go up 24-17. Murray would have three drives up seven in the fourth quarter to put the game away, but came up short. <laughs> Get it? Finally, on his fourth fourth quarter drive, Justin Herbert got LA into the end zone with 15 seconds left to make it 24-23. Much like Dougie P in Jacksonville, Brandon Staley went for two to win, and Herbert converted with a strike to Gerald Everett to seal the win 25-24 for LA. Herbert might have won the game, but I cannot forgive this coaching
coaching staff for turning him into a checkdown merchant. He's averaging just 9.6 yards per completion this year for fuck's sake. He averaged just 5.8 yards per attempt in this game. They are turning a historic, legendary, golden arm into Alex Smith, and it makes me pew. San Fran versus New Orleans. Jimmy Garoppolo has now learned how to weaponize his handsomeness to such an extent that he might have to be barred from the NFL for being too unfair. The Saints scored zero points on eight possessions. You want to know why? Because they were too busy looking at how gorgeous that son of a bitch was on the other sideline. All Jimmy really did in this 13-0 win was lead one touchdown drive and nine tries, and guess what? That was enough. Tom Brady gets called the GOAT for winning two Super Bowls where he led his offense to 13 points, but Jimmy gets called a scrub carried by his defense for winning, scoring 13 points. It's disgusting. It's anti-Italian discrimination, and I will not take it anymore. Jimmy, if you see this, please DM me or call me. For the love of God, call me. Kansas City versus the LA Rams corpses. The Rams are officially the worst defending Super Bowl champs ever. They're even finding ways to get their head coach concussions on the sideline now. Look, there's just no way a Bryce Perkins-led team stood any chance against Patrick Mahomes, as KC Kermit, who recently welcomed another child into the world, was pretty much in charge the entire time outside of his one obligatory what-the-fuck interception he threw in the end zone in the fourth quarter that gave Skip Bayless some troll material. At no point in this game did it ever feel like the Rams had a chance to win, not even when they got it to 20-10 to in the fourth quarter. That's just the level Mahomes is at now. Like with Brady up until this year, or back when Peyton was still running shit in Indian Denver, or Rodgers the last couple years in Green Bay. You can pencil in Mahomes for 12 to 13 wins every year, regardless of supporting Cat. I'm just glad I got to watch him from the beginning. All right, I'm getting off of my knees now, but these knee pads are very, very comfortable and they work really well. Las Vegas versus Seattle. Finally, an exciting game that was down to the wire. No offense to Stringer Bell. A Derek Carr interception on the opening play set up a 12 yard touchdown run by Kenneth Walker. Then Carr fired a touchdown to make it seven all. On his third drive, Carr threw another interception leading to a Seattle field goal, but he was pretty much perfect after this, continuing to tease fans all around about how good he can be at times. He found Mac Hollins on a 36 yard strike to go up 14 13, but the real star of the game for Las Vegas was Josh Jacobs, who, as I've said in past videos, is only the second worst drunk driver the team has drafted out of Alabama over the last four years. Following a Geno Smith interception, Jacobs broke off a 30-yard touchdown to give Vegas a 21-13 lead. Geno fired a 35-yard touchdown in response before a Las Vegas field goal made it 24-20 at halftime. Walker III ran in his second score of the day, and then Avicii look-alike Daniel Carlson hit a field goal to make it 27-all entering the fourth. Geno continued to shine, throwing another touchdown to give Seattle a 34-27 lead with 537 left, but Carr answered with his third touchdown pass of the day to tie it at 34 and eventually send the game into overtime, where after trading punts, Jacobs ripped off a walk-off 86-yard touchdown run to win the game 40-34. Seattle is wasting Geno Smith's prime. Philadelphia versus Green Bay. This was a somewhat bittersweet watch for me, as I obviously love watching my Eagles continue their dominance, but it was also a little bit sad, just, just a little bit, seeing one of my favorite quarterbacks ever, Aaron Rodgers, go out like this. Philly pounced early, going up 13-0 on two touchdown runs, thanks partly to a Rodgers interception, but Rodgers engineered two straight touchdown drives, including a laser to Randall Cobb for a touchdown to go up 14-13, but much like he has all season, Jalen Hurts was not to be denied. He led another touchdown drive, but Rodgers answered back with a ridiculous dime to tie the game at 20. Hertz found Quez Watkins on a 30-yard score to take a 27-20 lead at halftime, and after throwing another touchdown in the third to expand the lead to 14, Rodgers left the game with an injury. Jordan Love came in and threw a long touchdown to Christian Watson to make it 37-30 with nine minutes left, but Hertz calmly led a field goal drive to make it back up 10 points. Love then led another field goal drive to make it 40-33 with 108 left, but the onside kick failed and the Eagles ran out the rest of the clock to improve to an NFL best 10-1. Just give us the Lombardi now, please. Pittsburgh versus Indianapolis. If a battle between Kenny Pickett and a washed up Matt Ryan doesn't get you horny, then we can't be friends. I'm sorry. Because that's what this Monday Night Football matchup was, and all joking aside, it wasn't quite as bad as you might expect. The Steelers ripped off the first 13 points of the game and had a commanding 16 3 lead at halftime. It looked as though Kenny Kitten Mittens was going to have an easy win, but an 89 yard kickoff returned to start the second half by Indy's Dallas Flowers, set up a short touchdown drive capped off with a Jonathan Taylor touchdown run to make it 16 10. Not even a 16 play drive by Indy that ended in a lost fumble at Pittsburgh's one-yard line was enough to make Matt Ryan quit as he bounced back to fire a touchdown to give Indy a 17-16 lead entering the fourth. Pickett showed some moxie though, responding with a long touchdown drive of his own and a two-point conversion pass to give Pittsburgh a 24-17 lead with 10 minutes left. Indy would get two more cracks, no offense to Josh Gordon, to try and tie and win the game, but came up short each time. I don't think Pickett will ever be elite, but he could be Alex Smith with a stronger arm. Let's just hope he has better injury luck than Alex had. For those who don't know, this was a very 
very, very difficult week for me as I unexpectedly lost my beautiful Bernie's Mountain Dog, Lila. In honor of Lila and all the good times I had with her, this week's puppy time will be dedicated to her. I hope you enjoy, and I hope you don't get too emotional watching this because I was getting a little bit emotional making it. 